Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. A very warm welcome to worship this morning. Um, I'd like to just invite everybody after the service to come up into the hall for refreshments. Um, today we have a. Uh, Kathy wants to give out a, um, a couple of notices, I think. Both actually on behalf of Frida. Um, a couple of weeks ago when we had communion, Frida found this lovely little brooch on the floor afterwards. Um, if anybody owns it, it's a little sort of rose with what looks like bits of coral in it. So if anybody owns it or knows who owns it, I will put a picture in Connect if nobody claims it today. Um, but I thought I'd show you. That's Thursday. And also on behalf of Frida, Weaver's Lodge this Thursday, 11 a.m., as a um, it's a coffee and talk from the East Anglian Air Ambulance. Um, so raising money, fundraising for um, yeah for the East Anglian Air Ambulance. I will put this up at the top when we go up for coffee, and you can have a look with it. Okay, there's a phone number for connecting for contacting. Thanks. Thank you for that, Kathy. And uh, now I will pass you over to Sarah, who is going to lead us in worship today. Well, good morning. Yeah. What a lovely response. It's really lovely to see so many familiar faces in front of me, but new people too. Everybody is welcome here in our family because this is God's family and we're all here together. Um, but also welcome to the people who may be watching at home later on today or in the week. You too are part of us and you're very welcome to our worship service. So as we begin, let's pray. Father God, we come together now as your children to praise and to worship you. We declare you, Jesus, as our living Lord and our Saviour. Holy Spirit, we welcome you to be with us, to move among us, to inspire us, comfort and heal us. Father, we come to you imperfect. We confess that we have sinned. We ask for your forgiveness. And even as we do so, remember that you are faithful to your word and have forgiven us through the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. We remain humble and grateful for all the blessings you give us. Amen. So I'm going to read some verses from Psalm 135, and then we're going to go straight into our sun worship. So let's all stand together now, if you're able. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise him, you servants of the Lord. You who minister in the house of the Lord in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praise to his name, for that is pleasant. Your name, Lord, endures forever. Your renown, Lord, through all generations. Praise the Lord. Let us sing another praise be your welcome. We 
So let's, as we carry on with the service, just be aware of that. And really, I know this is a church service, but let's really keep him right at the forefront of our minds, being open to him in all that we think about, all that we sing, all that we say. Now, there's a phrase that we sometimes use, and I want to think about it just for a couple of minutes, because sometimes it's maybe a bit hard to understand if we really stop to think about it. So how many of us have heard or even said we are made in God's image? Yeah, it's a pretty standard saying, isn't it? It rolls off the tongue. Tom, you are made in God's image. The same as everybody here, I'm afraid. <laughs> but we all are. Isn't that really incredible? Now, well, normally when we say something is in the image of, we mean that it, one thing looks like another. And some people think that God looks a bit like this. <laughs> Not quite that, but we're getting there. There you go. So, do you think that's what this phrase means, if we're made in God's image? Are we to look like something like that? Let's hope, well, for me, I hope I don't look like that one day. Um, no, I don't think it really means quite that. So, what does it mean? What might it mean for us to be made in God's image? Well, maybe it's more about the ability that he has given us to be like him in some ways, not every way, because we're not God, but to be similar to him. So what do you think it might mean for us? What little bits might we be a bit like God? You can just shout them out. Free will. Free will. Okay, yeah, we do have free will. Absolutely, we can make our own choices. Anything else? To love other people. Yep, to love other, love other people, definitely. Anything else? Sorry. To understand others. To understand others. Mm. Yeah, to have definitely. the ability to create. Oh, thank you, Alan. I'm getting there. Yes, to be able to create, to be creative. Yep. Anything else? To seek justice. To seek justice, thank you. That's fantastic. Yeah, definitely. To seek justice. That's a really challenging one. Actually, they're all quite challenging, aren't they? Being kind, being patient, that's hard, isn't it, sometimes? Being good, being forgiven, being full of joy, being gentle, peaceful, faithful, self-controlled. Oh, that's some of the fruit of the spirit, isn't it? And um, with forgiving, I just chuck that one in because I think that's definitely like God. There's loads of different things, not just those, but many more. And one aspect is being creative, absolutely. And I like this picture a lot better. Have a look at that. So that's an artist working on a big piece of artwork, um, being very creative. I think that's, I mean, I just went to Google Images to find an artist, and this is the picture I, I liked. And I wonder, just this is by the by, if you can see a little face on the left-hand side. Can anybody see that in there? Yeah, isn't that amazing? <coughs> and God is creative. We believe that he made everything, don't we? The world, us, animals, mountains. Be pleased to know I'm not going to go on with a list of everything that I think God has made. Um, but the Bible teaches us that we can learn about God by looking at his creation. And it's amazing. And one of the ways that we can be like God is through our own creativity. Whatever that means for us, it does not mean you have to be an artist. We're creative in so many different ways. And when we are creative, that's us, an expression of us being in God's image. This summer, Sunday Club, as you may have heard, we might be in Sunday Club and know this, are getting very creative in the way that they are learning all about Joseph. And they're making some brilliant pieces of artwork. And when it comes to the beginning of September and our Sunday Club anniversary service, you'll be able to see them all completed. So we're going to sing now about our wonderful Creator God before Sunday Club do go out. 
to learn about the next section of the story and to get creative. Right, who wants an instrument? Hands up. I think the adults are all down here. So I'm not going to be the only one playing. You can do it while we're singing. I'm going to sing this song. Who's sung this before? Hands up. Yes. Two. Oh. Three, maybe. After you, Sonia, thank you. First of two, of two evening for today is Romans 10, verses 13 to 15, followed by Matthew 28, verses 15 to 20. 
Everyone who calls on his neighbour, the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one that has not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Now for the second reading. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. Amen. Well, thank you, Keith. A few months ago now, I attended the Youth Evangelism Conference was very good. I'm a youth worker, so that's why I was there doing that. The keynote session at the end was not only inspiring but challenging too. Um, a guy called Tim Alford spoke. He's the national director of a youth work organisation called Limitless, and he gave me a lot to think about in my own work. It was a call to reflect and to act. And I'd love to share some of what he said with you. So I've taken some of his points and added some of my own ideas as well. Of course, the focus for that was solely on young people, but I really believe this is relevant for people of all age groups. So I've just adapted it to kind of to fit everybody. So he came up with some of strategic priorities, I suppose, that he identified as being imperative for reaching people with the gospel, with the good news of Jesus. But before we have a quick look at those, I am going to just throw some numbers at you. I'm going to have a uh, think about some statistics just quickly to help us focus our minds. And these statistics are about young people. An organisation called One Hope conducted a worldwide study in youth culture. They found that globally, 43% of young people claim Christianity as their religion. That sounds quite impressive, I think. However, and unfortunately there is a however, only 7% of those young people display the behaviours and beliefs that we would understand to indicate that they are actually committed to Jesus, only 7%. And if we narrow it down to looking at just young people in Europe, I'm afraid that changes to only 2%. So it appears that only 2% of young people in Europe are, would be considered practising Christians. So worrying, isn't it? But from my experience, probably about accurate. So I suppose most of us have completed at least one questionnaire or census maybe that asks us what our religion is. And the largest growing religious category in that list of all the religions that they put to choose from is, well actually it's not a religion at all, it's the category of none. So you'll see at the top of that list is none. What religion are you? More and more people are ticking none. I don't have a religion at all. And these people are known as the nuns, which is somewhat ironic, isn't it, unfortunately? One survey found that 70, 70% percent of 16 to 29 year olds are nuns. And that 48% of churches have less than five children under the age of 16, and that 95% of young people under the age of 18 do not go to church. 
So the figures are startling. Um, I'm not going to throw lots more numbers at you now, but you get the picture. It sounds pretty dire, dire, doesn't it? And it should make us feel uncomfortable at the very least. It's a wake-up call. Do our hearts break over those numbers? Well, I'm sure that God's heart does. I'd like you just to spend half a moment thinking what your faith means to you, how Jesus impacts your life. Well, I hope there is something or lots that you think that Jesus does make your life better in many ways or some way. And some of us will even wonder how we could live without him. And we also know that Jesus is for everyone and he wants to be in the lives of all people. Do you know people of any age need that help right now, need Jesus right now? How different would life be for people to live out their lives knowing that their identity is as a child of God with the security that that brings? What would our society be like if that were so? Knowing that our identity is within God, in Jesus, is um, much better than basing our identity on looks or possessions, who friends are at any given time. And with young people, that can change a lot very quickly, friendship groups. It's much better than basing our identity on our relationship status or our job or any other number of things. Because those things can all be shifting sands. They can be unstable and they can cause anxiety and grief and low self-esteem and just the exhaustion of perpetually trying to fit in and be good enough. That is really hard work. The message that we bring, that Jesus is our rock and our fortress, our firm foundation that can never be shaken can always be trusted and where we don't have to work to fit in, but instead be accepted and loved just as we are, is exactly what we all need. You know, sometimes I think we even need to remind ourselves of that when times are tough, don't we? Because it doesn't always feel that way and we need to be reminded and to help each other out. In this church here, we're really blessed to have a wonderful number of children and young people and to be welcoming so many new people of all ages to our church family. It's, it really is wonderful. And God is at work. He is guiding new people to us and using us and the things that we do in the name of our church and in the name of him to draw people to himself. And we praise God for that, don't we? And sometimes you just kind of go along and it's, you know, oh, there's something new. But actually, when you just think about over the last, I don't know, six months or year or whatever it is, and think of all that God is doing here, it really is incredible and wonderful. But overall, fewer and fewer people are hearing the good news and experiencing it for themselves. And that means if the trend continues, fewer and fewer people following Jesus and spending an eternity with him. And if we don't act now, then when? When will we do it? Even in our own growing church, there is no time for complacency. Our Bible reading from Romans, that first reading that Keith brought, reminds us that people need to be told the good news and the people who tell them need to be sent. Well, some of us are called to do a specific work of sharing the good news 
through a recognised ministry or by running or helping at groups like Open Mind and Next Door and Young at Heart and Reach and even Youth for Christ, which is who I work for. But, you know, we are all called to be witnesses of Jesus in our everyday lives to those around us. Jesus sent his disciples to go and make more disciples across all nations. And because they did that, and those that followed, here we are. Isn't that amazing? What a legacy. Never underestimate how much God can use you to reach out to others with his love, even if it feels insignificant to you, because it might not be to them. We all have a part to play as this generation of disciples to pass it on. Maybe that is through praying for the young people who live on your street or the school that's nearest to you. It can be about talking about Jesus with members of your family. It can be inviting a friend or a neighbour to a carol service. It can be in the activities that we run in church that reach out to our local community. And it can be in supporting those who have a specific calling in this area and who are running those groups. So how do we go about this? Well, I guess those through lots of those things, but I'm not going to give you a, like a new list of things that we should be doing um, because we should just be guided by God and what our local needs are in our community. But there are a couple of principles to keep in mind. So the next principle is relationship over rhetoric. Relationship over rhetoric. So let's remember that Jesus' main strategy for evangelism was to love. He didn't plan big events or programs, although big things did happen around him, of course. But he did life with people. He was compassionate and he met their needs. He absolutely did declare the good news and God and the kingdom of heaven. And he did it in the context of relationships and love not rhetoric, which I think is just kind of saying the right things but not following through, so it, it doesn't feel genuine to the person on the other end. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which um, many of us will recognise, it says, If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor, and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. We can have the best words, but if we say them without love, then they just don't ring true. Jesus said in John chapter 17, that by our unity with him, with God and with each other, that the world will know that God sent him and loves them, the, the world, um, just as God loved Jesus. That unity is so important. And in John 13, Jesus said, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. A group of people who love each other and their community radically and worship Jesus will stand out as different. Evangelism happens when we love in such a way that it provokes a question to which Jesus is the answer. That's my favourite quote of this whole lecture that I heard at the Youth Evangelism Conference. It says so much, doesn't it? Evangelism happens when we love in such a way that it provokes a question to which Jesus is the answer. So think for a moment, dream up what people might see in us and our churches 
that would provoke them to ask the question where Jesus is our answer. All of our the programs and the groups and the events that we run are good, aren't they? But they're not the only thing. That foundation needs to be that we're first united in love with God and with each other. It's a solid foundation to build on. And actually, I think it's something that we do really well here. Um, so let's press on and make it even more obvious to our local community that everyone is unconditionally welcomed here, that they will be loved and cared for regardless of who they are. The next principle is presence over performance. Who do you think is the better evangelist? Is it you and me or is it the Holy Spirit? We need to ensure that we aren't only providing space for others and even ourselves to just hear about and discuss God but also to encounter the very presence of God through the Holy Spirit. When there is a shift from the performance or doing of whatever it is that we're doing to, towards the, the presence of God, with that being the focus, in whatever it is, then we'll have an opportunity for people to experience God firsthand and to respond to him. And it is that personal encounter with the Holy Spirit that can change everything. British Youth for Christ carried out research called the Z to A of Faith and Spirituality, and they found that first-hand experience of God answering prayer has a significant impact on young people's faith, whether they follow Jesus or not. And it's that first-hand experience of God that transformation occurs. It's important for us to facilitate these transformative experiences and not just carry out or perform programs at young people or you know, anybody of any age. And that's, you know, that's really important to me to remember as I'm planning Illuminate Youth Group and the different, the different work that I do. And it's not easy. But when we focus on God and just welcoming God into whatever we're doing, hopefully that just gives him, maybe it releases us to allow God the freedom to do his work. Young people are less interested in arguments and debates about the existence of God. They will take notice, they will take less notice of a well-reasoned argument for the case of God and will more likely say, show me the reality of God. The experience is the proof. Do you know, in our normal day-to-day -day lives, we might say to somebody, I'll pray for you about that and trust God to answer and make himself known. We might suggest that they have a go at praying about something. We could share our testimonies, just a little snippet of why we chose to follow Jesus, why we follow Jesus now, what he's done in our lives. And we can offer opportunities to help them have a go themselves, see if it's true, if it works. Last term, I did some RE lessons out at Stour Valley Community School in Clare. And we were doing a lesson with the Year 10 GCSE group who were taking RE as one of their subjects, exam subjects. And they prepared a few questions for the end of the lesson. So we made sure there was time for them to just ask whatever they wanted to ask. And they asked, they asked all kinds of questions, but they asked why I decided to become a Christian and why I am a Christian, because they wanted to know. And they asked two similar questions. 
How long do you have to be a Christian before you can get into heaven? And how many good things do you have to do before you can get into heaven? What an opportunity that was for me. Just those few moments that I took um, to talk about those things was, I think, one of the most profound times in the last year of all of the, the youth work that I've done to be able to say what Jesus means to be in my life and to explain that getting into heaven, which is how they phrased it, um, isn't by what we do at all, but by the gift of Jesus dying in our place. And it was, it was, I mean, that was a real God-given gift to be able to do that. And I really loved that they were genuine questions that they wanted answers to. And I think God was at work through that. I hope he was, I'm sure he must have been, that they will store away those little answers just in a few moments. And that might just take them a little step closer towards him. And we can remember, and this is an encouragement, that the Holy Spirit is a much better evangelist than we are. And he, he will work through us, but he can also do his own thing as well. And I think we can praise and thank God for that. So this is all a huge challenge for us. And as I've said, absolutely in my youth work. And I know that I need to keep spending time praying through it and making new opportunities to share Jesus with young people. But I wonder sometimes if we become tired, maybe even a bit apathetic in our day-to-day -day lives about this, or are we really fired up? There is an urgency now to reach out, to introduce people to Jesus and to see the transformations that he wants to make in their lives, to build good relationships and to provide opportunities for them to experience the Holy Spirit for themselves to get to know Jesus personally. The people of today who don't yet know God are less likely to ever know him if we don't show them. And I am honestly ever grateful that he is more than capable, God is more than capable of doing this himself without our help, and he does. There are amazing stories of how God reaches out to people with no help from us mere humans getting in the way, and yet he does still choose to use us. We need to be a sent people, instructed to do this by Jesus himself. And let's remember that last line from the Romans reading, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. So let's have beautiful feet. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for all of your disciples who have gone before us, generation upon generation of them, who have answered your call to take the good news of your death, resurrection and salvation throughout the world. Please help us to follow in their footsteps, Lord. Please guide us and give us opportunities as we go about our daily lives to connect the people we come across to you. Amen. Well, we're going to sing, in now, sing again now in response to what I've said. Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you lead me. I will hold your people in my heart. I, the Lord of sea and sky. Please do stand with me.
Alan is going to come now with our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you are our rock of peace, our one true hope. We depend on you. We come to you now in prayer that by following our Saviour Jesus Christ and trying to help others <coughs> to get to know and believe in him, we will make a difference to this hurting world of ours. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. hear our prayer. Amen. We pray for the many people in our government and hospitals who do know and believe in you. Give them your wisdom, we pray, in their efforts to help heal our nation from the current financial and health crises. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We pray for your church worldwide, especially in countries where Christians are being persecuted only because of their belief in you. In particular this week, we pray for those who are supporting Afghan refugees in neighbouring countries with food and aid. We pray that those expelled from their homeland by fear of Taliban reprisals would see and feel the love of Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord, we pray for our local churches, especially for those involved in outreach to those suffering around us through Reach, Open Mind, Next Door, and Town Pastors, and there are others. In Jesus' name, bless their actions and conversations with the presence of your Holy Spirit. May their labours be blessed with your healing touch even when your name is not allowed to be mentioned. Nothing is impossible for you, Lord. We praise you for the way you use people of faith and turn their weaknesses into strengths for your purposes. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, make us a welcoming body of Christ here in this church. Help us to discern what you are doing here and join in seeking less to please ourselves, but more to please you. In a moment of silence now, Lord, we remember those on our hearts who are suffering with ill health, whether physical or mental. Bless them in Jesus' name with your healing, your peace and your comfort. We bring all our prayers to him who shows us how to live life in all its fullness, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let us now say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Amen. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Thank you, Alan, for your prayers. It's time for our final hymn now. Tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord.
bring to you our gifts of money that are given here and that we give by standing order. We bring you and give you our whole lives as well. I pray that you'll bless them, that you'll use them for your glory, Lord, and for the furtherance of your kingdom here in Haverhill and around the world. In Jesus' name, Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.